hidden, Kathy, but you'll see me. Then I'll put it back up. Cool. All right. All righty. Well, thank you, folks, for joining the ACAP Winston-Salem broadcast for the month of May. I am Bob Kane, uh, one of the co-chairs, along with Melissa Hunt. You see her in the bottom corner waving there. Hey, Melissa. So uh, we are the co-chairs for the ACAP Winston-Salem chapter. We are part of ACAP Community, a larger organization that is a, uh, a North Carolina interest that has grown to Pennsylvania, and we are getting a lot of interest across America. We hope you'll be interested, too. Welcome back to many of our guests who've, who've uh, been faithful over the years before COVID hit us, before the pandemic, and, uh, and to new guests. We're excited that you're joining us. So um, let me do a little bit of housekeeping here, if you don't mind. We, um, this, oh, big, big news. I highlighted it in my notes. Yay, this is the 10th anniversary of ACAP as an entity that is giving information to adult children of aging parents and, and bringing uh, great vetted speakers who have wonderful information as you are helping your loved one. Uh, predominantly uh, our guests are, are adult children of aging parents as the title says so, but we welcome folks who are taking care of aunts and uncles and siblings as well. So uh, if you were a caretaker for a loved one, paid or unpaid, you are welcome, and we're glad you're making use of the information. You probably found us on acapcommunity.org, which is the national website. And so if you are there, and we would love to have you interact with us through this presentation, so please go. Uh, we want you to chat. We have a chat feature, and Melissa and I will kind of monitor that and flag our, uh, our presenters tonight. So uh, if you go to the website, click on this presentation uh, on YouTube, you can participate in live chat. So please hop on, type in where you're from, you know, we want to know. Um, and, uh, but just click the join chat on YouTube line. Um, while you're on our website, if uh, uh, cert certainly not while our presenters are speaking, but you know, after, please come back to the website, take a look at the local chapters where they're located. We have one in the Hickory area, one in uh, Center County, Pennsylvania. Um, Guilford County has one um, and Statesville is, is getting their footing, we're happy to say. So uh, check out our local chapters. We'd love to get you on the listserv so you can get invitations for these, uh, for these events, for all of the different chapters that you're interested in. And check out, we, we put these videos online after so you can go back at your own convenience and review them get that information share that with friends uh, we have a youtube site please like the youtube site uh, that really helps us to, to disseminate the information that much more efficiently uh, to folks that need it so um, want to introduce our speakers tonight so our topic first of all is strategies for effectively managing medications um, so we have uh, both of our presenters are from uh, Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, and they work in population health pharmacy program. And so we have Kathy Barber. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Dr. Kathy Barber and Dr. Amanda Bonney. Hi, Amanda. And uh, so, uh, like I said, both of them work for Wake Forest Baptist Health uh, Atrium. And got to get used to adding the atrium. Y'all still doing that? <laughs> yes. Uh, so in addition to having earned their doctors of pharmacy degrees, Dr. Barber also completed a one-year residency in managed care pharmacy uh, at the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. Uh, and Dr. Bonnie began her uh, career as a retail pharmacist. Later, she worked to optimize medication regimens for palliative hospice patients. So a nice uh, spectrum of experience there. Both doctors Barber and Bonnie see their primary job function, and this is why we have them on as collaborating with patients and providers to develop and implement clinical pharmacy strategies, which result in high quality, effective healthcare. I got to tell you personally, I'm delighted. I, I, um, I worked in a pharmacy through high school and college, and in in the work that I do now in the senior health arena, uh, we've got great clinicians across the spectrum. And every public talk I do, I'm like, why don't we involve the pharmacists more? You know, you guys have a critical role to play. And sadly, I think, very sadly, I think it's an indictment of our industry. You kind of get 
forgotten. And so apologies from our industry. Thank you for being here. I think you have phenomenal information to offer. So uh, under the topic tonight, what we're going to look at is some reasons that uh, as, as our parents age, sometimes we start running across, uh, obviously we've seen it, uh, mismanaging medications, errors, things like that. Um, and so we see a decline in medical conditions as a result. So uh, then, you know, worst case scenario, folks, uh, loved ones, parents get hospitalized or rehospitalizations. And so we're going to look at some strategies tonight uh, that you can use to help your parents, uh, first of all, to come in and kind of assess, you know, where mom and dad me mentally, physically, environmentally, uh, what's not uh, fitting together for us. Uh, and is it related to missed medications and errors? And then they're going to discuss with us some specific practical tips uh, for preventing these issues from becoming crises. And we're going to explore medication access resources that you can find that are available to your loved one. So, uh, like I said, please sign in through the YouTube channel, chat with us. We will get going. And ladies, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Barber. I'm going to awesome. blow up your screen there. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much for having both myself and Amanda tonight. Um, this is definitely a topic that is near and dear to my heart, um, as well as ACAP in general, because I actually take care of my own mother. Um, and I can definitely tell you that she has many medications and has been hospitalized um, for medication issues that she's had just from taking them um, inappropriately. Um, and so I'm really excited to be talking about this tonight so that hopefully I can help prevent other parents from um, having injuries as well from maybe mismanaging their medications. Um, and so, as you had said, we're here to give you hopefully some good practical tips and strategies to effectively manage um, different types of medications. And so here's our objectives. Really overall, we exactly what I just said. We just want to give tips um, and kind of identify some risk factors for parents that might specifically have some medication errors. Maybe they have um, multiple medications on their list. Um, and so just some things that you can do to um, help decrease the medication errors. And then also talk about medication access as well. Um, something that Amanda and I both work on every day is helping um, really and anybody in the area of Forsyth County, Guilford County, um, all around here helping to access their medications because many of them are very expensive. Um, and so there are a lot of financial resources um, in the area. And so we just want to let you guys know all about those as well. And so just to start out with the background, um, medication errors. So as I said that word already, those are, it's the most common patient safety error. And what I mean by medication errors, it could be something like a missed dose. And maybe that's because, you know, your parent is on multiple medications um, and sometimes they forget to take them. Um, it could be duplicate therapy. Some people are on um, multiple drugs that are actually do the same exact thing. Um, and maybe they're on multiple ones that do the same thing because they have multiple providers. Um, so your parent might see an orthopedics doctor. They might see a neurologist. They have their primary care provider. They could have an endocrinologist. And somewhere in there, they end up on multiple medications that do the same thing. Um, and so we're going to speak about that a little bit. They could be on unnecessary medications. Um, sometimes a medication is started, maybe it is needed for just a little bit, um, but after a while they might not need it anymore. But for some reason, that medication just never comes off of the medication list and you keep taking it and taking it and it's just not needed. Um, another medication error that we'll talk about is dosing errors. And so this could be either the, the drug was just prescribed at the wrong dose, um, or it could be that the parent is actually just taking it or incorrectly uh, just because they're just unaware of what the dose actually is. Um, I would, I probably every day speak to somebody um, that is like, oh, I thought I was only supposed to be taking, you know, one of this medication, but they're actually supposed to be taking two. So dosing errors are really quite frequent. It could also 
um, as people age, their kidneys and their livers may their liver might not work as well. Um, and so doses might have to be adjusted and that doesn't happen all the time. And that can definitely lead to an, um, an error and a harmful reaction. And then we'll also talk about a little bit about drug interactions as well. And so, like I was saying earlier, a lot of times, especially as people age, they're on multiple medications. Um, and some of those, sometimes those medications might interact with each other in uh, a very harmful way. And when I say medications, I don't only just mean prescriptions. I also mean over-the-counter um, drugs as well. It could be something like Tylenol, or it could be um, even a natural supplement as well. Um, so all of those things could potentially interact with each other and cause a medication error. So these errors or adverse could cause an adverse drug reaction. So that when I say that, I mean a just harmful reaction to any medicinal product doesn't necessarily have to be prescription. It is one of the leading causes of death in the United States, which kind of blew my mind a little bit when I read that statistic. Um, the rate of these harmful reactions and then the injuries due to these reactions, it increases as the, as of course, as the more and more medications get added on to the patient's medications list, but especially once they get like four and above medications on the list, that rate of harmful reaction, it really increases. And four medications on, you know, someone taking four medications, that's not very much. I've definitely seen plenty of people that have 20 plus medications um, on their medication list. And, and so we really just want to make sure that we are managing those medications appropriately. So that way we avoid any type of injury, hospitalization, anything like that. The reason that these harmful reactions can happen with multiple medications is because the combinations can just become very complicated. Um, and what I thought was also a very interesting to statistic, and I know it's a little bit old because um, this is from the year 2000, but in 2000, um, 2.8 billion prescriptions were filled. That's 10 prescriptions for every one person in the United States. Um, that again, also blew my mind because um, that is just so many prescriptions. That leads me into, um, again, this idea of polypharmacy and how dangerous it can be. Um, like I said, it is a leading cause of these harmful drug effects. Um, polypharmacy is defined as someone having regularly using at least five medications. And as I said, this is over the counter as well as prescription. And then the statistic that I have over to the right is the percent of Americans over the age of 65 that are using at least five medications or more. Um, and that is 67% of Americans over the age of 65. So that to me is a pretty large number, um, especially seeing as these adverse drug reactions are one of the leading causes of death um, in, in America. The reason that polypharmacy is so dangerous. So again, being on five or more medications, like I was saying, there could be a duplicate in therapy. Um, this happens quite often. Um, a lot of times, so if someone has diabetes, they could be on a medication. Um, we'll just say one of the medications is glipizide. Um, it's a very common medication for many people to be on, and it causes your body to release more insulin. A lot of the times people will be on that medication plus actual insulin. And so that can lead them to have um, dangerous low blood sugars. Um, and so that is something that my own mother has personally been in the hospital for, um, was for low blood sugars that can be very, very dangerous and lead to death. And so we wanna make sure that we're not duplicating therapy. Um, unnecessary treatments is also something that happens quite frequently. I feel like one that I see the most um, a lot of the times, especially in the older population, um, acid reflux can really become an issue and um, someone might be put on something called a, like a proton pump inhibitor, such as um, protonics. And 
that's fine for a short amount of time. However, really, you're only supposed to be on that medication for maybe eight weeks, unless there's some, you know, serious longstanding issue that you need it longer than that, because those medications can cause like severe diarrhea. Um, they can cause fractures, um, things like that. And so it's really important that, you know, someone doesn't stay on that longer than they need to. Um, and it happens very, very frequently. Drug-drug interactions is very common within polypharmacy. Um, and so you, you, as you build on to the medication list, as you, you know, the more and more that you have, these drugs are going to interact because they're going to get, you know, eaten up by your body in different ways and also have different interactions within your body. Um, and so sometimes they can have um, problems um, interacting with each other, or they might just not even get eliminated from your body in the way that they're supposed to, um, just because of the way that they interact with each other. So that can become a serious problem. And then there's also drug disease interactions too. And so sometimes um, people will be taking one medication for one disease, and it can actually worsen another disease. Um, one that I see frequently is if someone's on a certain medication for osteoporosis, that medication can commonly cause issues with acid reflux. Um, and so it just can cause this whole other host of, of issues. Um, and so that is commonly seen when, when people are on multiple medications as well. Now let's identify some risk factors that may lead to medication errors. There are factors that contribute to missed medications, medication misuse, and overall noncompliance. Here, they're broken down into categories of physical, mental, and environmental risk factors. Let's also take some time to talk through some examples. There are physical changes that may present and progress as we age. Decreased dexterity can impact a patient's ability to open a child-proof prescription bottle or properly administer a dose from an inhaler. Impaired vision can impact a patient's ability to see the number of units of insulin they're going to inject via an insulin pen or on a syringe. Decreased mobility can make it more difficult for a patient to get up and move around to an area of the house where their medications are stored. Larger tablets and capsules may become difficult to swallow, which may deter a patient from taking these medications altogether. The presence of mental health problems can often adversely affect treatments of other chronic diseases and can be underrecognized in our older patients. Confusion may cause a patient to take a medication differently than prescribed, which could lead to the medication being ineffective or could cause an adverse drug reaction. Confusion can also be a side effect of medications. Memory loss can complicate medication administration and could potentially lead to a patient taking duplicate doses. Forgetfulness is one of the most common reported reasons for missed dosage and medication noncompliance amongst all patients. Mistrust, fear, and anxiety can impact a patient's willingness to seek quality care or to take a life-saving medication. The conditions in which a patient lives may change as they age and can have a, ba a big influence on their health. Isolation and lack of social support can negatively impact a patient's quality of life and their motivation to take their medications. Older patients may not be given adequate information to enable them to make informed choices about their care or fully understand the medications that they're taking. Homebound patients often need to be connected to additional services that are able to come directly to their homes, such as house call medical visits or medication delivery services to be able to receive the same quality of care as others. Patients who live in rural areas of the state may have limited access to providers and specialists who manage their chronic disease states. A lack of consistent follow-up could potentially hinder medication optimization. It's important to speak to and spend time with our older parents if you are able to help identify these risk factors. Keep your eyes and your ears open. If you notice something, please say something. And also ensure that they're attending their annual wellness visits 
so that they can receive the appropriate screening, which will allow trained healthcare professionals to identify any issues that may be negatively impacting their overall health. Next, Kathy is going to review some tips on managing medications. All right, so my number one tip um, for managing medications would be to talk with the pharmacist. Um, that can be your pharmacist, that can be your parents' pharmacist, your loved one's pharmacist, anyone's pharmacist. Um, we all have the ability to educate on anyone's uh, medication list as long as we have all of that the, all of the correct information. And so it can be a little bit difficult if that is a pharmacist within the uh, retail setting, um, especially if the person who, whoever's medication list has to be looked at does not go to just that pharmacy, um, which really points out a very important point here is that do try to have all the medications come from one pharmacy. That way that pharmacist has the full and appropriate list. Um, a lot of the times I'll see that people will go to multiple pharmacies and then I kind of have to go around and call 18 different pharmacies to get a full list. So that way I can go through the drugs one by one and make sure that they're appropriate and talk to um, patients about them. Um, and so number one, go to one pharmacy for all medications, unless of course there's a reason, maybe it's a specialty medication and that can only come from one certain pharmacy. Obviously there will be like outliers to this, but for the most part, if you can go to just one pharmacy, it makes it a lot easier for the pharmacist to speak with you about the medications. Um, and so, like I said, the pharmacist can go through the drugs one by one, um, explain uh, what they're for, how you are to take them, um, what the outcomes are. So if it's a medication for diabetes, um, you can discuss, um, you know, it's supposed to lower you, you, the A1C um, percent. It's, you know, what are a, a blood sugars supposed to be appropriately? How often should you be monitoring your blood sugars? Things like that. Um, you can counsel on administration times. A lot of pharmacists, especially in the community, um, there are a lot of great pharmacists at a lot of independent pharmacies as well um, in your community. And they can be really, really good at making things such as charts. Um, for instance, I, I frequently make charts like, you know, what time do you take certain medications? Because um, once we start getting more than like five or more drugs, it can become really difficult to know like, okay, which ones can I take together? What time do I take all of these? Um, and so your, your local pharmacist can really be helpful in making something like that. They're also really good at, they can set up things like pill boxes as well. Um, I've had patients that were blind and I had to like make my own pill box that was usable for someone who like couldn't actually see something and they, they were able to know, okay, you know, in the morning I'm taking these ones in the afternoon, I'm taking these ones, things like that. Um, and able to set that up. So education is something huge that the pharmacist can do for you. The second thing pharmacists are great at are um, looking at, you know, do some medications or can some medications come off this medication list? So that's de-prescribing. Um, so if you or your parent are having some type of side effect uh, with a medication, let the pharmacist know. Um, they might know, okay, you know, maybe you just so maybe you just started this medication and you're having some nausea. That can be pretty common with a lot of medications, but that nausea typically goes away after about two weeks. So, or maybe it's something like, oh no, that shouldn't be happening. Um, so your pharmacist is go can really have that knowledge and be able to tell you, okay, you need to go to your provider. This isn't normal, or, you know, this is normal. It should go away after, you know, the next week or two. If it doesn't, then go back to your provider. Um, maybe you need something different. Uh, pharmacists are really good at checking for duplicate therapy as well. Um, and then they can also really help in decreasing pill burden. So pill burden, um, again, going back to this idea of polypharmacy, when you're on so many pills, it can make it so hard to keep track of them. And so sometimes um, certain pills will come in combinations. Um, and so say you're on two different blood pressure medications, there are actually pills that um, are combo combinations of both of those pills. So both pills in one pill. Um, there's actually some that have three pills in one pill. And so it can make it a lot easier instead of, you know, having to remember to take all three. Well, now we only have this one that has to be remembered. Kathy, may, may I 
interrupt yes. and ask uh, on on that conversation. Is there a point? Is it always that you're, as the pharmacist, saying to the to the patient, "Hey, let me educate you." Now you have to go back to your primary and have this conversation, or is there a point where the pharmacist intervenes and says, "Let me call the physician and talk clinical to clinical"? How does that work? Granular. I'm going to let Amanda actually answer that because she has so much experience in the retail um, area. I would love her um, to tell me her experience. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I would say that the conversation normally happens clinical to clinical, but a lot of times I am the first person to discover or have that critical conversation with the patient. So when I'm physically removed from some of these providers, it is a phone call or a fax away in order to share that information and get a timely response. Um, that is why I enjoy currently working integrated with a health system because we have quicker access and um, visibility with our providers because we share an electronic health record. Um, so I feel like there is more seamless care um, and more visibility all around. But I will say that the ultimate decisions to come that come with medications happen from a pharmacist to provider conversation. And then that information is relayed back to the patient, either through me as their local pharmacist or directly from the provider's office um, for next steps or follow up if needed. So basically, Excellent. if a patient comes in, um, Amanda, and they're like, you know, can I get this in this combination pill? Um, you can call the, the provider's office mm -hmm. to see if they can se send in a prescription. Um, and so that could either be a phone call or like she said, a fax or something like that. Um, and so the pharmacist can absolutely call that in. I'm also very big on patients advocating for themselves as well. Um, and so there is like my chart capabilities. Um, and I understand that my chart can be pretty difficult if someone is not super tech savvy. Um, and so, but that is always a possibility is sending your provider a message over my chart and asking, you know, can I get this medication in a combination pill? Um, and then, of course, always calling the provider's office yourself. So it really can come from either way. Excellent. The pharmacist can call and request um, that combination pill, or you can also um, do that as well. Excellent. Excellent. And we have a, uh, hey, Harriet, Harriet joined our chat. So people are watching. Uh, she's got a question. Is it, and, and uh, for the guest, Yes, uh, I don't know if I said it earlier, both of our, our presenters tonight, very gracious to say, hey, we, we like an interactive audience. So um, so if you've got questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Harriet says, is it better to keep the medicine in the original bottle or a pill box? Will the med lose its strength in the pill box? Yeah, so that's a really great question. It really sometimes will depend on the medication. Some most tablets will be absolutely fine going into a pill box. Um, Amanda actually will talk about this a little bit later on, but they will do perfectly fine in a pill box. Of course, you want to keep them out of like extreme heat and out of sunlight. There are certain pills that um, should stay within the bottle. Um, and so that is definitely something to ask your pharmacist um, to, again, with the great reason to talk to, to your local pharmacist is they'll be able to tell you this one's ter perfectly fine um, to take out of the bottle. Typically, I, I feel most medications are fine to do that. Some are just a little bit more sensitive to light. Um, and so they do need to stay in their original bottle. Um, and some are sensitive to some other things as well. But typically, it's pretty okay to put them into a pillbox. Thank you. Um, and so some medications can also be um, had in an extended release form. Um, and so metformin is a huge drug. I feel like I switch over to extended release formulations often um, because it's a very common medication for those with diabetes. Um, and it is twice, twice a day. And that second, you know, uh, tablet can be very difficult to remember on many medications. And so sometimes it's a lot easier to take an extended release where it's only going to be a once daily dosing. Um, and so something like that is great to ask your pharmacist too to see if it comes in extended release. So it lasts a little bit longer in your body. So you only need to take it the one time a day. 
And the last thing is that pharmacists can be great at um, giving you financial assistance resources, um, as, especially like your local pharmacies will know maybe some community resources in your area. Um, and they might also know of some resources such as copay cards that you can find on the internet as well. And we're gonna talk about some of those resources later too. The second tip that I have is every single time you go to your doctor, you see your nurse, you see your pharmacist, you ask these three questions. And this is called the ask me three. Um, and so the first question you wanna ask is what is my main problem? It's really important to know exactly what's going on. Um, and I sometimes feel that, you know, medical jargon can just really get in the way of understanding exactly what is going on with you or with your parent. I've absolutely gone to the doctor with my grandmother um, and my mother and, you know, been like, okay, exactly what is going on. So that way I could explain it, um, you know, in just a different way to my mother, or at least that way I have that information. Um, so that way I can kind of keep track of what's going on. The second question is what do I need to do? And so, you know, it's good to have the information of what is wrong, but you need to kind of know what's coming up next. Is there like a medical, is there a test that I have to do? Um, like a stress test, or do I have to go get my blood drawn? Is there a procedure that's going to have to be done? So those are important to know. And then why is it important for me to do this? Um, many times people are on medications and they just don't know why. Um, and I totally get that because, you know, it feels like as I go back to that statistic I had at the very beginning, um, you know, so many people are on so many medications. It's almost like you go into the doctor and you come out with something new um, and, you know, why. So it's really important to know the why. And I cannot stress enough that it's really important that you just don't leave the doctor until you ask all of these questions and you firmly understand it. Don't be embarrassed and don't be shy. If you don't get it the first time you ask these questions, just sit there and, and ask until you get it. Um, don't feel rushed. You definitely shouldn't feel rushed. I want you to advocate for yourself, advocate for your parent, um, and really feel empowered to understand everything that's going on. The pharmacies that you receive your medications from offer a variety of services to support medication use and medication adherence. You can update your preferences to use non-child resistant safety caps for prescription bottles. Some pharmacies have entirely different caps that are easy to snap on and off of the bottles. Other pharmacies have caps like the one shown in the bottom right hand corner where there are threads on top of the standard cap and if you turn the cap upside down, it becomes easier to twist on and off of the bottle. Notifications can be helpful to remind patients when refills are due and to avoid running out of medications. It's an, also a great way to receive up-to-date information on when refills are ready for pickup or when refills have been shipped. Optimizing medication refills by receiving 90-day supplies syncing up your medications to be able to refill them all at once, and utilizing delivery services may increase convenience and overcome common barriers to medication adherence. Our fourth tip focuses on incorporating adherence tools. In the upcoming slides, I will share some examples of these adherence tools and share what I feel are some pros and cons of each. I am not endorsing any particular product or service by showing them to you today. There are several options available under each category that we will touch on. And if you choose to utilize one of these tools, I would encourage you to do some of your own research to see which option would be the best fit for you or your loved one. Some pharmacies offer compliance packaging to help with medication organization and administration. Pill Pack by Amazon Pharmacy offers individual pouches of medications that includes all of the patient's medications that need to be given on a certain date and time. A patient will have more than one pill pack per day if they take medications at different times each day. Medications that are prescribed to be taken as needed will not be included in the pill pack and will be sent separately in a normal prescription bottle. 
I like that pill pack offers free shipping. Also, if you were traveling, you could rip off the pill packs that you would need for the duration of your trip and they become very portable. It also helps patients become aware of missed doses if they go to take their next pouch of medication and they realize that there's one still on the roll from a time that has already passed. Compliance packaging in general is not ideal for patients who have frequent medication changes. It is really best for patients who are on a stable medication regimen, especially with the example here, with pill pack being a mail order pharmacy, it would be very challenging to modify the pill packs that are remaining in the roll at your house to remove or add medications in between shipments. If you go to the pill pack website on their frequently asked questions, it says that you are always available to call and speak with one of the pharmacists and they encourage you to do that if one of these situations occurs with a medication change. Another type of compliance packaging is a blister card like this Shore Med Adherence blister card shown here. These are often manually filled by pharmacy staff. There are options available to hold multiple medications up to 12 medications based on the size of the blister compartment. This blister card showed here has spaces for morning, noon, evening, and bedtime dosing. Each blister can be punched out through the back of the card to provide a patient with a medication that should be taken at that given date and time. This card shown here would last a patient one week. So the patient would actually need four cards total to equal a one month supply. I like that blister cards like this include a complete medication list with directions and a picture of what the medication tablet or capsule should look like. You can see that on the left hand side of the card. This also, like the pill packs, has visual reinforcement to show if you took your medication dose or not. Patients do need to be educated to the, that if they that sh they should skip the dose if they have missed that time period, and that it is um, and if they're outside that appropriate window to take a catch up dose. Patients should never be taking two doses at at one time. Similar to pill pack. Medication changes can be problematic. However, most of these compliance packages come from local pharmacies and they can usually be taken back to the pharmacy to be repackaged to accommodate medication changes. Also, if a patient is on more than 12 medications, they would need to have multiple blister cards, which excessive bl blister cards could be a source of confusion for these patients. We already talked a little bit about pill boxes, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about them at this time. Pill boxes are a simple way to sort medications for daily and weekly administration. They might have one single container, or they might have multiple compartments to sort your medications according to your prescribed schedule. One important consideration when using a fill pill box is are you able to fill the pill box accurately? It's important to be able to read the directions on the prescription bottle and be able to place the medication in each appropriate compartment. I recommend that patients fill the pill box with one medication at a time, and when they are finished with that medication, they set it aside in a designated location to avoid filling the pill box more than once with the same medication. Another consideration is where do you store the pill box? Ideally, it needs to be stored flat in order to minimize the risk of individual compartments opening. Pillboxes can become damaged when heavy weight or pressure is applied to them, and if this were to be the case, they would need to be replaced. Pillboxes come in a variety of sizes and designs to meet a patient's individual needs. Of note, the pillbox on the right has pictures to identify the time of day for a patient who has lower health literacy levels. Some allow you to remove the individual compartments for specific days of the week. One potential concern is that once the individual medications are taken out of their prescription bottles, it may be hard to identify the individual medications. Please always reach out to your pharmacist to help you identify any loose unknown tablets before taking them. One simple and underutilized adherence tool is an alarm. Alarms help you keep track of times when a patient should be taking medication. It can be a standalone adherence tool, but it's also a great addition to another tool like a pill box. In the bottom left-hand corner, 
is a med center talking alarm clock. This device can set up to four daily alarms to alert you when your medications are due. It repeats a verbal reminder and notifies you of the time, the day, and the daily dose to take. For example, the machine would say, good morning, please take your morning pills for the 20th. The patient then has to press the alarm acknowledge button on the right hand side to confirm that they took the dose and it tells you when the next daily dose will be due. This alarm clock costs a one-time fee of $50. Patients can use existing devices such as the alarm feature on a smartphone shown in the center of the screen. Keep in mind that all of these devices are only helpful if they're powered on and they're near the patient at the time the alarm sounds. And Amanda, I'd, I'd like to point out working with dementia patients, I think sometimes adult caregiving children or caregivers will overestimate somebody's ability with dementia. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, one of my favorite articles is you can't out tech dementia. So these are, those are great, but oh, there's a, there's a limit. Mm -hmm. and all the more reason to talk to your pharmacist and come back and go, that's not working. Now what do we do? <laughs> yes. Well, we're about to dive in, just like you said, Pardon? great transition to where some technology is trying to be utilized in this space. It's and we going to try to outsmart the dementia. Yes. <laughs> trying to try to be marketed to outsmart the dementia, for um, sure. <laughs> technology can help develop solutions that are common problems, including medication management. One thing that's been created for patients is an at-home automatic pill dispenser. Truly, it's like your personal medication vending machine. On the left is a Hero pill dispenser. It can hold up to 10 different medications. This device uses a light and sound signal to alert users of dispensing time, and it also sends a cell phone alert notification. This company is unique because they developed a smartphone application that helps users with loading and programming medication regimens. This dispenser, you are required to pay a $99 initiation fee and a reoccurring $25 monthly charge. On the right is a competitor called Medicube. It can hold up to 16 different medications, six more than its hero competitor. This system alerts patients and caregivers with a message sent via phone call, email, or text message. It does not have a smartphone application, but it does have an online portal where you can review summaries and reports for adherence, pill inventory, and pill dispensing times. This dispenser is priced at a one-time, very expensive fee of $1,500, which may be cost prohibitive for some patients. These are very nice and fancy machines, but they do require intensive initial setup to program a patient's medications and then ongoing maintenance to keep a sufficient medication inventory. As with every piece of technology, there will be glitches and errors, which can be confusing to troubleshoot for patients and may delay medication administration. They are likely not ideal for a patient who is not tech savvy or does not have close caregiver support. Another te technology option that may be helpful is a medication reminder app that can be downloaded onto a smartphone. The first application that I have highlighted is called MediSafe. MediSafe is a user-friendly, top-rated app that sends users medication and refill reminders. It also provides drug interaction warnings and helps caregivers manage prescriptions for loved ones if they are listed as what they call a med friend. The next application I've highlighted is called My Therapy. My Therapy is a comprehensive health and wellness application that allows users to set reminders for medications, but it also includes information on vital measurements such as blood pressure readings and physical activity. Users can see patterns or trends in the data that they input into the app, and reports can actually be printed and be available to share with healthcare providers at appointments. I also really like that the Med Therapy app is available in several different languages, including Spanish. Most medication reminder applications require you to manually enter each medication on your medication list and that information um, in order to be accurate and appropriate for the reminders. It does not link with your pharmacy records or your electronic health record. 
It makes this initial work and set up a barrier that many patients might not even start using this tool to begin with. Another way that you may be able to improve adherence to medications is to associate taking medications with another activity that you do daily. James Clear is an author of a number one New York Times bestselling book called Automatic Habits. He writes about habits, decision making, and continuous improvement. He shares in his book that one of the best ways to build a new habit is to identify a current habit that you're already doing each day and then stack a new behavior on top of it. This is known as habit stacking. For example, if you make yourself a cup of coffee every morning, stacking taking your morning medications right after you brew that cup of coffee could help you remember to take those morning doses. Meal time can be helpful for medications that you need to take more than once per day, and especially medications that are recommended to be taken with food. Is there anything that you do every night before you go to bed, like taking off your earrings or taking off your watch? This could be helpful for you to remember those tricky bedtime doses that often get missed. For once weekly medications, choosing to take your dose on a Sunday when you're getting ready to go to church could be a great way to help you remember to take that particular medication that's only done one day in a week. Keeping medications in an area of your home that you spend a lot of time in or spend time in at a certain point in the day can be helpful to help you remember to take your medications. An ideal area of your home is an area that's out of direct sunlight has low humidity, and maintains a cool, stable temperature. The manufacturers say that 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit is acceptable for most medications. Possible areas to store medications could be your nightstand, a dining room table, on a bookshelf, or a living room end table. When exposed to light, heat, and moisture, it can decrease how effective a medication is, and it may no longer be good for you to take. Areas that should we should avoid keeping our medications in include a bathroom cabinet or a windowsill or above any type of appliance that gets hot like your stove. Some medications need to be stored separately in a special place like medications that require colder refrigerated temperatures. Some medications are unique in that they need um, to be kept separately um, such as liquids that require a dosing syringe to give appropriate doses or injection devices that might require additional pen supplies like pen needles. Finally, if you have children or pets in your home, you may need to be mindful of the location that you choose to keep your medications in to avoid accidental ingestions. Some household areas or medication organizers do utilize a lock feature, which might be a valuable safety feature for you to incorporate if this is applicable to you. Our fifth tip is disposing of unused medications. It's very important for you and your loved ones to remove unneeded medications from your home as a measure of preventing medication misuse and potential harm. Please go through where you keep your medications on at least an annual basis to identify medication therapies that may be expired or may have been stopped by your provider. One day that can prompt you once a year to complete this is the National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. This occurs every April and is hosted by different community locations. This year in Forsyth County, the members of the Sheriff's Office will be located at Mount Zion Baptist Church parking lot on April 30th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for you to be able to turn in unneeded medications for safe disposal. If you are not able to attend the National Prescription Drug Take Back Day event, there are public disposal locations in various different locations. You can choose, I mean, you can search for these locations on the DEA Diversion Drug Disposal website to find different drop boxes. In the picture on the top right hand corner of the slide is a drop box location located in a local CVS pharmacy. Also, all of the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist outpatient pharmacy locations have a drug disposal box like this. One newer product that is called Dispose RX. Dispose RX Incorporated is actually a North Carolina based company, and their website states that they are dedicated to decreasing the risks of drug diversion, overdoses, 
suicides, accidental poisonings, and antibiotic resistance by removing the misuse of leftover medications. These packets, when combined with water, form a solid that can be safely thrown in the trash can. They are currently available at more than 50% of retail pharmacies in the country. The FDA strongly emphasized that when possible, the best way to dispose of potentially dangerous medications is promptly bringing them back to a drug take back location if one is readily available. When someone is unable to access a drug take back location, they may need to dispose of a medication at home. There are a small number of medications that may be especially harmful and in some cases fatal if just one dose were used by someone other than the person they're originally prescribed for. These medications are controlled substances and are often sought after for their misuse or abuse potential. The FDA created a list referred to as the flush list, which you can find online to indicate which medications they recommend that you should flush down the toilet in order to prevent danger to people and pets in your home. It's important to also note that the FDA continues to seek alternative solutions to flushing. Current data suggests that the disposal of these select drugs and the quantities that they anticipate through flushing has no substantial environmental impact, but the FDA is continuing to study these issues ongoing. Drugs that are not on the flush list can be discarded in household trash after taking safety precautions, such as deleting or concealing your personal information that's on your prescription bottle containers. Patients are to seal medications in a bag mixed with an unpleasant substance like dirt, coffee grounds, or kitty litter. Affording medications can be difficult, like we've already discussed. Kathy is now going to discuss the medication access resources that are available to you and your family members. Okay, and so I think that the first um, medication access option that I think of when I think of the aging population would be Medicare. Um, and so Medicare is um, an in, it's insurance and it's regulated by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, which is regulated by the federal government. Um, typically, I think about it um, as people 65 years and older are eligible for it, but sometimes people under, um, under age 65 with certain disabilities are also eligible for this as well. Medicare can be kind of confusing, um, and I, so I just wanted to briefly go over some of the high points, but I definitely urge you to um, contact uh, different counselors, Medicare counselors, which I'll, which I'll talk about um, near the end here as well, to get more information um, about Medicare. Um, but there are four main parts of Medicare. Um, the first one being Part A. So this is your hospital insurance, or that's how I think of it. Um, so your inpatient stays, uh, skilled nursing, home health hospice. The one thing that it does not cover um, would be a nursing home, so long-term care. So that's not going to be covered under Medicare. Part B is for your doctor's visits. It's also for durable medical equipment um, and things such as diabetic supplies and nebulizers. The main ones that I really wanted to talk about would be Part C and Part D because I'm a pharmacist, and this is your prescription benefit coverage. Um, and so Part C is a Medicare Advantage plan. When I think of Part C, I think of it as Parts A and B plus prescription drug coverage, which is Part D. Um, so Part C is basically A plus B plus D. The difference with parts C and D here are that you get them for, through a private health plan. So a private health plan would be like Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, United Healthcare, and Humana. Um, and there are certain times that you're allowed to enroll in these, um, which is, is from October through December. Um, and so part C is going to be your prescription drug plan, also with your A and B, so your hospital and doctor's visits. However, if you have, or if your parent has parts A and B, they might just get D separately through a private health plan. Um, and so the important thing I wanna point out here really, because it's so very confusing, is that sometimes people think that they have drug coverage, but they really only have Medicare part A and B. So you just have to realize that A and B do not cover drugs. 
Um, and so you want to make sure that if you need prescription drug coverage, that you either get Part C or Part D through a health plan. And so just because that wasn't confusing enough, who pays for what when it comes to prescription drugs? It's so confusing and it changes throughout the year. Um, and the, the amount that gets paid also changes every year. So very confusing overall and very briefly and on the top. Um, step one or in January when um, your Medicare benefits, when they restart, you start in this deductible phase. In this deductible phase, the patient pays for, for most drugs, for the entire drug. There are some instances for some plans where certain drugs might still be covered, but for the most part, you pay for everything. That's up into, until you pay for a certain amount. Um, that certain amount changes each year. It also can change based on the plan. Some plans honestly don't even have a deductible which is why I find it very important that you pick the plan that financially works best for you. After that deductible phase, when you get done paying for everything, you'll go into this initial coverage phase. In this phase, you pay some and then your plan pays some. What you pay will either be called a copay or a coinsurance. Copays are a certain dollar amount. So say you might pay like $10 for certain drugs um, per month. Coinsurance is a percentage. So if a drug is $5 and you have a 50% copay, that means you need to pay 50% of that $5. So you'll pay $2.50 and then your insurance plan will pay $2.50 for that medication. Again, once you pay a certain amount out of pocket for these medications, I mean, once your health plan pays a certain amount, you go into this coverage gap phase, or um, traditionally it's called the donut hole. Donut hole used to be where you pay, again, everything, so you have to pay the full cost of the drug, not anymore. Now you pay 25% of the total drug cost. That sounds nice, but some medications still are very expensive, so 25% of very expensive is still very expensive. Um, and so that can be very difficult, which is why in a second we'll talk about some options that you could have if, um, you're in, if the medications are still expensive, even with your prescription coverage through Medicare. Again, once you pay a whole bunch of money out of pocket, then you might go into a catastrophic coverage. Only about 4% of Medicare um, patients will actually get catastrophic coverage. At that point, you pay very little for your um, prescriptions and your health plan pays for the for most of it main point from this whole slide it is that it's very important to get educated on what plan one covers the drugs that you're on and then two you're financially able to afford as well so what can really help you pick out what plan is best for you and ensure that you can afford it um there is a they're called SHIP counselors. So they're met, they're counselors for Medicare. It's the Medicare and Seniors Health Insurance Information Program. Um, and what they can do is they these people, they get um, certified through Medicare in order to help you pick out what plan is best for you. Not only can they help you pick out what plan is best for you, they can also help you sign up for a program called Extra Help. Um, there's a, this, I was just thinking about what the statistic was and I always kind of, I, sometimes I mess it up, but I believe it is that in North Carolina, 40% of North Carolinians actually are able to get a reduction in the amount of uh, money that they pay for their medications, whether that's a reduced premium, um, a reduced deductible, um, reduced co-pays. So 40% of North Carolinians actually are eligible for this extra help program, but only 20% of North Carolinians have actually tried to get this. So that is a huge, large amount of money that's out there, um, a huge opportunity. Um, and so I really urge um, everybody, if someone is eligible for Medicare to please, um, if you need help paying for your medications, 
um, apply for the extra help program through Medicare. There's a few ways to apply for it. You can get a SHIP counselor. I think personally, that's the best way. That's the way that I send all of my patients. You can find SHIP counselors a lot of times through senior centers. They might have a SHIP counselor. Um, there's also um, SHIP counselors, like there's one out of High Point University that we work with. So there's some all over. Um, and then you can also um, call the Department of Insurance. They're also able to find you a counselor as well. So we have some phone numbers on here. Um, you can also apply online at the social security.gov website, and you can also call the social security administration or go down to your local social security office. Um, I just can't, this slide, I can't stress it enough. Um, I just think it's a huge opportunity that everybody really needs to try um, to take a piece out of. If, if you are watching from Forsyth County, many of our guests are, the Shepherd Center on Ebert yes. Street is the portal for Forsyth County, so... Yes, yes, it is. Um, for sure. Yeah, the Shepherd Center. Um, we, we definitely send a lot of our patients down there um, to sign up for extra help. Um, another option um, to help with medication access is please ensure that you are going to a pharmacy that is preferred within um, or by your health plan. So for instance, um, Humana, they might prefer Walmart. Um, if you go to Walmart, then you might be able to get your medication for free or just for a very um, more affordable price versus if you go to a pharmacy outside of their network, um, it will be more expensive. Um, sometimes they also will have you use mail order as well. The way that you can tell all of these this information is please read the evidence of coverage booklet that comes to you after you sign up for Medicare. Um, you can also call the pharmacy help desk that's on the back of your Medicare card. Um, and then durable medical equipment such as diabetic supplies, this goes through your Part B, as I said previously, so that's Part B like boy. Um, and sometimes that equipment it might be able to come from a regular retail pharmacy, but sometimes it has to come from a dur durable medical equipment supplier. Um, again, you can find that in your evidence of coverage booklet, or you can always call the pharmacy help desk as well. There are patient assistance programs where you can get free or low cost medications through different manufacturers of branded medications. This is really only for medications that are branded, um, which is those are typically the ones that are very expensive. Um, so that works. Um, and there are eligibility. There is eligibility requirements. It's kind of different depending on which manufacturer you're trying to get eligibility through. Um, you can always ask your provider or your pharmacist to help you um, figure out which uh, uh, manufacturer um, you might need to apply for assistance through. And then, of course, there's local community resources. In Forsyth County, there, there's crisis control in the Shalom Project. Many of these resources are for those who are uninsured, but sometimes they're also if you're in the coverage gap or that donut hole. Um, for instance, NC Medicist is the statewide resource that I like to use for free pharmacy, um, for free medications. Um, and typically it is for uninsured, but they do take into account if you're a Medicare patient and you're in the coverage gap. And then this is where we're going to end. It's really the ultimate goal of everything we've talked about today. One, we really just want to make sure that you, you and your parents have access to the necessary medications to keep you safe. Um, to make sure that your medication regimens are effective. And overall, that's because we really hope to preserve um, your parents' quality of life. Um, and out, out of all of this, if, you know, the, I feel like the big takeaway would be to please advocate for yourself and for your loved ones. Um, I, I really think that that's the most important thing that um, sometimes is missing is that you don't take the time to say, you know, ask those three questions. You know, this is like, what's the problem? What do I do now? And and really advocate for yourself. Ladies, thank you very, very much. Lots and lots of good information and, and almost as important as good information presented in a cogent, logical order. Thank you. Uh, I love your, your presentation style. Uh, so we, we really appreciate y'all doing this tonight. Uh, and uh, got a got a little bit of time if anybody's got last minute burning chat questions looking at those um, 
And while I'm looking for those, I had a, a, a friend who was going through the, the training that you guys went through years ago. And, and she said, or at the time, maybe it's changed. I know we just finished mapping the human genome. Wow. Uh, after mm -hmm. 20 something years at that time, probably 10, 15 years ago, I think a lot of people believe, I believe there's like this master list of all the interaction of drugs that doesn't exist, does it? <laughs> hmm. um, so you, we actually, there are inter drug interaction checkers okay. that um, are accessible uh, online. Okay. Um, that, Like for instance, Micromedics is one of them. I use it. You do need a subscription to it. Okay. Um, and it is important a lot of the time that you do have a medical background as well. So that way you're able to understand because most drugs are actually going to interact, but sometimes that interaction might not be super important. So if you do check for interactions um, online, like on Google, it might tell you, oh my goodness, this is going to cause you to have an arrhythmia and your heart's going to beat incorrectly. But that might not actually be as serious as it sounds, um, depending on the medication. And so because that's something some small, that- Some small study proved 2% of the patients had that. And so they had to post it, right? It could be that, or um, sometimes that particular interaction is super common. And really most of the time, it's not a huge deal until you have like five medications on board that cause that specific reaction, then I'll definitely become more worried about it. Okay. Yeah. A lot of the interactions are based on um, the biochemistry or the science behind how the compounds and the molecules actually work. And then when they're administered into human beings, what happens clinically may or may not be significant. So we have access to known drug interactions. So those have come from studies or previous patient use experiences as well as the science that we have um, in our favor. But there are also a lot of unknown drug interactions. And I think that that is more common in the areas of the vitamins and supplement space, just because there's not as much data um, available to us for that. And also sometimes there is um, mislabeling or misbranding of what's actually in them. And so there could be interactions going on that we can't be mindful of just because there's a lack of information available to us. So I'm not saying that uh, vitamins and supplements are, are not good or appropriate for you to take if you've discussed them with your healthcare provider. Just know that when you're moving into that space, there is a little bit less regulation and it'll be more difficult for both your pharmacist and your provider to give you an educated answer to potential drug interactions um, just due to um, information gaps. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, I just wanted to add, you talked about mapping, you know, the human genome and everything. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my research is in genomics. And so it's very interesting um, to see that just because one person's body reacts a certain way because their body might metabolize or eat up a medication a certain way, mm -hmm. not everybody's body is going to do that in the same way. So some people might, their bodies might eliminate a drug faster than someone else's. So just because one person has a certain reaction doesn't necessarily mean that somebody else will either. So it's another time when it's important to have somebody with some type, you know, with, with a medical background um, that can understand um, the genetics portion as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would, uh, I appreciate that. That's wonderful insight. And the, the, um, on, on the over-the-counter piece, is it fair to say, I'll be less generous than you, Amanda, there's still <laughs> snake oil for sale every day in every store across America that is strictly intended to get your money. Now, I'm, I'm a fan of vitamins. We need vitamins, yes. Get it through your food, please, if you can, right? Ideally. Yeah. But there are models being sold every day of something that's may not be best for you. So all the more reason, please, please talk to your pharmacist about not just your meds, your prescription meds, but the over-the-counter stuff you're taking too. Yeah, I try not to think about that or it may impact me losing sleep just out of worry for myself and others and my loved ones. So, but yes, um, there are things where there people are just trying to make a dollar. Um, there are certain um, certifications, like certain symbols that you might see on some of the bottles. Mm -hmm. Like USP is one of like the agencies that does do a little bit of oversight on some vitamins and supplements. So you can look for some of those. Um, and it just pretty much says that it's coming from 
a more reputable um, manufacturer where they've done some extra steps to just be transparent in their um, manufacturing processes and with their ingredient list. And um, sometimes you'll say like number one pharmacist recommended. Well, that's yes. a marketing pitch too. But if you do see those um, logos that are included on those labelings, that does mean that that manufacturer did take an extra step to be a little bit more um, transparent and ensure that their product is higher quality for you. So the sourcing of the materials that go into the product. Okay. Mm -hmm. USB. I like that. I've seen that. I'd forgotten that. Thank you. Always, mm -hmm. always good. Well, ladies, thank you so, so much. Uh, I want to uh, thank you again. We really appreciate your time. Great presentation. Great information. I uh, also want to thank the guests who are watching. Um, and uh, as, as we said at the beginning, oh, uh, also want to thank our sponsor. Uh, each of the many of the ACAP chapters have local sponsors. And so our uh, our core sponsor for the Winston-Salem chapter is the Mrs. Norma Charles Sink Fund. And so a lot of this that you're getting for free, folks, all this great information comes from sponsors. So we, we are very appreciative uh, that they make these kind of broadcasts happen. Uh, we hope you'll join us back next month, May 17th, always for the uh, Winston chapter, the uh, third Tuesday uh, at 530. We're going to be talking about movement for older bodies and uh, another uh, just happens to be another two presenters associated with Wake Forest University and Atrium Wake Forest Baptist Health, uh, Christina Soriano and Dr. Christina Hugenschmidt. Great, great ladies, wonderful information, amazing program. So please come back for that. And uh, check out the website, acapcommunity.org. Get involved. If you give us your email, nobody gets our email list. We're very protective of that. We're not selling it to third parties, and we just want to get you connected to good information like this. So thank you. Thank you all, and have a beautiful evening. Good night. Thank you. Bye, y'all.